All right, so real quick, I'm gonna get started and explain what the Hive Think Tank does and how today's ground rules are gonna work. Uh, if you are joining us again, welcome back. If you're new, hi, my name is Maddie. I lead uh, people and programs at the Hive, including the Hive Think Tank. And today's session is gonna be so good. Steve has spoken with us in the past and he is going to continue to speak on events related to AI. So you definitely need to watch- I think this is the fourth time. Is it the fourth time he's speaking for us? Oh, the fourth time, I'm sorry. See, there we go, <laughs> it's the fourth time. And there's gonna be a lot more. So you're gonna to have to check back on our website to make sure that you sign up for all of our future events with Steve. And today's session is being recorded. It's gonna be automatically sent out to you guys tomorrow in your email. Um, so if you have a friend that wanted to join but couldn't make it, or if you have to drop off early, no problem. Recording will be available for you tomorrow. And last but not least, we love questions. Definitely ask Steve all your hard questions. We wanna make him work for it, okay? So I need you guys to just do me a favor and use the Q&A button. It's located at the bottom of your screen underneath all the videos. And if you guys use that, that'll be easier because if you guys ask questions in the chat, then they get lost and you guys can upvote questions when they're in the Q&A function. So just remember to click that button and submit your question that way. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna just quickly explain what the Hive Think Tank does before I hand the mic over to TM Ravi, who is the Hive's Managing Director and Founder. Thanks, Ravi. Great, so welcome again today, everyone. The Hive Think Tank is an ecosystem of corporations, entrepreneurs, thought leaders. Uh, we are putting out content on our blog as well as with events and we so look forward to going back to normal and having in-person events. But for now, we're definitely still doing webinars. So I will drop the link for our meetup group in the chat. That way you guys can subscribe and stay up to date on all of our latest and greatest events. And thanks to our sponsors. If you want to get in contact uh, or if you want to work with us on either events or find out more about sponsorship, please contact me. I will drop my email in the chat as well. And then we've got a couple of events coming up. We have an amazing event, another one with the Hive Southeast Asia, which is our newest uh, location to open up over Malaysia. And this is gonna focus on empowering uh, female entrepreneurs and just some of the stories, the struggles, the challenges, the successes. Uh, it's definitely a great event that you're gonna wanna sign up for and I will drop the link. And then one more, Robbie. Perfect. And then we haven't even put this online yet. This is going to be at the end of June. Uh, we're going to be doing an event on critical infrastructure protection, and it's going to focus on cybersecurity. And we will be doing that with our partner and sponsor, Avanta Ventures. So stay tuned for that link as well. Without further ado, here's Ravi. So, so uh, before I jump into my portion, maybe just talk about a few series the, um, that, that we are getting started. The uh, uh, first one is, of course, with Steve here, and we'll be doing a whole set of events around AI, and, and Steve is kicking it off today. The second is, is going to be around um, insure tech and fintech, and, and we are doing that in collaboration with Avanta Ventures, which is really um, a part of CSAA, the corporate venture of CSAA. So, so this particular event on cybersecurity is part of that. We are also starting a sustainability series and, and we'll have events around sustainable energy sustainability, supply chain, um, uh, uh, you know, around CP sustainability and consumer product goods. So uh, look out for that. And, and of course, with our global entities, we continue to do various events, especially with with our, our partners in, in Malaysia and, and the Southeast Asia. So, so, so briefly, um, the Hive Think Tank is brought to you by the Hive. And, and so we are a venture studio. It's a particular subclass of venture capital where we are very active and, and collaborate with corporations, collaborate with entrepreneurs to start companies. And, Thematically, these companies are focused around leveraging data and data-related techniques. So think about it as a deep tech-focused uh, venture capital firm. And, and we, we apply that to a number of different verticals, as well as to the general enterprise. Um, and and uh, we have a presence, of course, here in, in, in the US. We are on a fourth fund. 
Um, we also have entities in Brazil and India. Brazil recently had a very big exit. And, and most recently, we've started the Hive in Southeast Asia in collaboration with the government of Malaysia and as part of their Dana Panjana program. And, and so the government of Malaysia is a 50% investor in the Hive Southeast Asia. So um, moving forward, we are, we are soon going to have uh, the Hive covering the MENA region. And we are doing that in collaboration with Aramco. And next year, probably this time next year, the Hive in, in Europe. So, so you can see that uh, we are going from a small kind of Palo Alto presence to a kind of a global presence. Um, with that, I'd like to um, introduce our good friend, uh, Steve Omohundro. Steve has been in this area of AI for you know, 35 years or, or more. He's currently at, at Facebook. Uh, Steve has a, has a PhD in physics. He was a faculty member in University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, where um, Steve, I was actually born there in Carl Memorial Hospital. And, and, and so he has, he has been in startups and research labs and corporations, uh, worked with a number of uh, people, uh, Stephen Wolfram on Mathematica, uh, uh, on, uh, with Danny Hillis and the Thinking Machines uh, Inc. crowd on Star Lisp. And, and he's authored a number of books, you know, Geometric Perturbation Theory in Physics is one of them. Uh, Steve is a movie star, and, and he appears in the Universal Pictures uh, movie, We Need to Talk About AI. And, and we have had Steve speak here on a variety of different topics, but also on the social implications of, of AI, which happens to be one of his uh, 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 areas of, of focus. With that, uh, let me hand it over to Steve. Great, thank you so much. Let me just get my screen going here. So I'm so happy to be here and thank you all for coming. And uh, I would like to talk today about the uh, importance of generative AI. And so let me start by saying, what is generative AI? So any machine learning model or statistical model will typically have some observed data that you see and some hidden variables that you don't see. And the most common models are what are sometimes called discriminative models, which try to directly predict hidden variables from observed variables. What I'm gonna argue is more important today are generative models, which try and model the process by which the hidden variables give rise to the observed variables and that that gives you much better generalization and flexibility as we'll see. So there are six takeaways I would like you to uh, get from this if I'm successful. The first is that the deep learning revolution so far has been primarily discriminative. The second is that we now have amazing, unbelievable hardware that's at human brain level, but we don't have the software that corresponds to that yet. Uh, the third point is that there are generative models that I've been calling generative 1.0, things like uh, GANs, VAEs, GPT-3, if you've heard of those, uh, and they're doing amazing, great things, but they're not quite everything we need, and that I'm going to argue we need uh, generative models, the next generation, which incorporate causality, theory of mind, and reasoning, and that if we get that, I believe we'll have AI empathy and new capacity for human AI co-creation, and that this will be the driver for innovative AI business and for a new uh, societal structures, and it's gonna be great. So let's start back with the deep learning revolution. Many people identify this uh, with the 2012 release of what's now called AlexNet, which was Jeff Hinton and two of his students. They built this network that's shown here on the left, and uh, it dramatically improved performance in classifying images from the ImageNet uh, database. And it generated so much excitement and so much surprise. Uh, it has now come out, at the time it was secret, but it's come out that Google purchased the three of them, a little teeny company with the three of them, for $44 million. And there's a new book uh, that describes that process. Very, very interesting. Um, how did they do it? What was different? Well, you know, people have been studying neural nets for ages. You know, the um, perceptrons were one of the very first AI models back to the 1950s. 
when I started working in AI in the 1980s, there was a lot of interest in neural nets, but it didn't quite do anything all that uh, exciting. And the big difference now, or one of the big differences is that we have hardware. And back in, in the AlexNet days, it was this NVIDIA GeForce GTX 580 that cost $500 was a GPU card and people were able to run neural nets on it and dramatically improve performance. So much more powerful hardware together with much larger data sets. And uh, the, the AlexNet uh, built on top of this ImageNet data set that was built at Stanford, which at the time had 1.2 million labeled visual examples. And that was big enough to really train the model to do very well. And it showed the power of deep learning. So in 2013, uh, the company DeepMind uh, had a similar uh, huge coup and they built a network they called DQN that played seven Atari video games directly from the pixels on the screen of the Atari video game and it predicted what movements uh, that the, the player should make. And they were able to do much better than any other uh, AI system at this. And uh, it's now come out that Google purchased them shortly thereafter for $600 million. So huge investment began in the 2010, 2012 timeframe, partly based on these fairly simple looking discriminative models. Both of those are discriminative models. And uh, why such big investment? What's, what's the deal here? What, what, what's, what's the logic behind that? And uh, I think the logic is that these technologies are likely to completely transform the nature of business and the nature of society. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers recently did a, a very nice analysis in which they predict, uh, according to their models, that uh, AI and the AI that they're talking about are mostly discriminative systems of this type is going to generate uh, $15.7 trillion per year by the year 2030. And uh, so if that's really true, if they're, you know, the estimates are correct, uh, it's worth enormous investment at the present time. So uh, the excitement and the money going into this area has really led to advances on all sorts of fronts. The one that's most exciting is uh, NVIDIA when they saw that, hey, all these people are using our video cards to do these neural nets and AI, they started you know, focusing very much on that area. And a couple, about a year ago or so, they came out with their DGX A100, which is just a phenomenal, amazing system that's targeted really specifically at deep learning. And uh, they estimate it as uh, being able to perform at peak five petaflops of performance. I mean, it's not cheap, it's $199,000, but five petaflops is so far beyond what we were thinking was gonna be possible you know, a couple decades ago that it's really mind blowing. And it's an especially interesting number because recently people have analyzed from a whole bunch of different perspectives what the likely hardware performance of the human brain is and uh, it's a very hard calculation to do, and there's some sort of noisy, but the sort of consensus average is about one petaflop. So that says that this NVIDIA uh, DGX100 is of the same, of the order that should be able to simulate the human brain. Of course, we don't have the software for that simulation yet. And so that means that, uh, you know, we've got to really think about how we represent things. And that's part of what I want to talk about today. So what's wrong with these discriminative models? Um, lots of people have realized that there are issues with them. First of all, they need lots and lots of training data, uh, huge data sets. And that's one reason that they've been successful is because we now have huge data sets, but that's not at all the way humans work. Humans can often learn from single example or a few examples of something. And so these networks are behaving very differently than human cognition. Uh, secondly, they have adversarial examples. And there have been a bunch of these published where uh, somebody takes a, you know, a network that can classify dogs from cats and they change one pixel in a dog picture and it says it's a cat. And uh, so this is really problematic in systems which are operating in the world, say that are meant to you know, detect hate speech and prevent it. If you can uh, you know, uh, fool those systems by just changing a few pixels, that's not a good thing. Uh, the third thing that's wrong with them is that they don't generalize very well beyond the training set. And so um, in real world applications, sometimes you have a very constrained domain with a you know, fixed set of data and that's all you ever wanna work on, that's great. But uh, in many applications, things are changing all the time. If you're trying to do commercial applications with new products coming, new products change all the time. So if you have a classifier, which was really great for last month's products, it may not uh, be appropriate for this month's products. 
Uh, the next problem with them is that they tend to create inscrutable representations. If you look at the neuro neurons inside of AlexNet, they don't have any natural semantic meaning. And so you can't, when it makes a prediction like, yes, this is a dog, you can't really explain why it's saying that. A whole field of explainable AI has emerged to try and improve that situation. But intrinsically, these discriminative models tend to create very complex, not very well separated uh, representations of, of semantics. And the last, which is related to that, is that knowledge is difficult to transfer from these networks in that um, it's not represented in a uh, coherent, separable form. And so it's very difficult to um, uh, move it to another network or to extract a certain, just a certain piece of knowledge uh, out of these systems. So why is anybody using these if they have all these problems? Well, the big win, the big advantage of these discriminative networks is that they can be applied to any situation anywhere by anyone. Basically, you can download a PyTorch or a TensorFlow uh, uh, system and some uh, open source networks and apply it to your task. And if you've got enough data, there's a good chance that uh, it's going to work well. And you don't have to know much about the domain. And so uh, it has a niche in that way that's really, really great. So what's the alternative? What do generative models look like? Well, um, there's what I'm calling generative models 1.0. It's a whole slew of exploration. They're much more experimental at this stage, much more research oriented. Uh, things like Bayesian networks, generative adversarial networks or GANs, variational autoencoders or VAEs, autoregressive models, normalizing flows, survey networks, and there are many, many others. And um, they, the current generation can, you can show them a bunch of examples of a domain, such as examples of images, examples of music for sound, examples of video, examples of gameplay. Uh, and uh, they will try and build a generative model of that domain, which looks as much as possible like the samples you've given it. And there've been some amazing and astounding successes. And I'll show you a few. The problem is that they don't really understand anything about the domain and the way that they're generating them does not respect the actual semantics of the domain. And I think that's the area in which we're gonna really make some advances soon. So uh, the inventor of GANs was uh, Ian Goodfellow. Uh, he posted this uh, Twitter a few years ago where I guess GANs were invented in 2014 and uh, they trained them on images of faces. And the very first ones were, hey, pretty credible face, but you wouldn't mistake it for a photograph. By 2016, they were getting a little better. By 2017, they looked like photographs and you couldn't tell them apart. And now there are websites which are, you know, these people are not real. And it looks like a whole bunch of pictures of real people and they're not. Um, uh, NVIDIA has an amazing uh, system they called, well, they had a first version called StyleGAN and now they have StyleGAN 2, which can generate very high resolution images of faces and they've uh, created knobs for varying, you know, things like skin, skin color, hair color, uh, various facial characteristics, emotions, lighting, all of that are beginning to be separable uh, uh, semantic features that they can control. And they can generate a wide range of very realistic and very, you know, emotionally compelling faces. Uh, there's a group in Germany that's been combining uh, GANs, a special uh, version of GANs called vector quantized GANs with transformers. And they've been able to generate extremely high resolution natural scenes that are really just stunning. This is one example of an image from them. Uh, OpenAI has done amazing things with models, uh, particularly based on transformers, which is a, a certain attention model. And they've gotten enormous excitement and interest from their GPT-3 language model. Uh, which is writing all kinds of text and poetry. Here's an, an example poem about the, the COVID-19. It's a long, long way to the other side of the fence. And I'm tired of living in a house that's on fire. So I'm not sure it's the best poetry in the world, but it's pretty striking that it comes from an AI system. Uh, they've recently done a variant very similar to their GPT-3, but applied to images and images combined with text. Uh, and they call it DALI, and uh, you can give it short textual phrases and it will generate images corresponding to those phrases. And so here's, an, and it's stunning, amazing. Uh, they haven't released the system yet, but they have a, uh, a post on their site sort of giving examples. So here's one where you give it the phrase, a kangaroo made of croissant, 
and it generates these images, which are kind of odd, but they're definitely kangaroo-like, and they definitely look like the sort of thing you might get if you baked a croissant, and that it is synthesizing these out of nothing is quite uh, remarkable. Another similar example is a stained glass window with an image of a magenta strawberry. And the images it generates are very stained glass like, and uh, they have a magenta strawberry. It's, you know, stunning. You, these are the kinds of things you might expect a human artist to create. And the fact that uh, this kind of generative model, just trained on large amounts of unlabeled uh, images and text, is able to do this is really quite remarkable. So the problem with both GPT-3 and DALI is that it's fairly uncontrolled. Uh, GPT-3 is sort of well known for uh, sometimes generating beautiful, amazing uh, pr prose and other times generating hate speech and inserting you know, inappropriate things in the middle of things. And so uh, it's, it's part that indicates sort of the problem with integrating these sort of first generation of generative models. very powerful. So what do we need for the next generation of generative models? So I would argue, and many other groups now are starting to explore these things, that we need to have them generate things in the same structure that the actual world generates them. In particular, the world is based on causality. We have events which cause other events, and we would like these systems to model that causal structure. We would like them to be simulation-based, to be able to actually represent the way interactions occur in the real world. Uh, in particular, we would like them to model reality in their internal infrastructure so that they can generalize and they can create in reality as opposed to in a kind of uh, uh, artificial world. We want them to be semantic and explainable. We want them to have composable models so that we can take a model that's been learned in one situation and apply it in another one. We want the knowledge to be transferable so that we can get modules of knowledge and combine them. We want it to be able to perform meta learning so that it can apply what it has learned in some domains to new domains. And we would like to be able to have controllable creative synthesis so that it can solve important human problems and adapt very rapidly to new situations. So just to give an example of uh, the psychologists are looking at these things and the psychologists are making great advances in understanding how human cognition works and how does human cognition differ from today's AI models. And uh, this is an example that's taken from Josh Tenenbaum's group at MIT. He's a psychologist. And um, I will you know, introspect as you consider this task and you can see what your own mind is doing, your own cognition, and we can see how that might happen in an AI system. So he's got these synthesized little drawings of tables with blocks, red and yellow blocks on them. And what your task is, is to look at one of these pictures. And if somebody were to bump into that table to guess whether more red blocks or more yellow blocks would end up on the floor. And for most people, this first uh, image on the upper left, they'd say, well, there's more red blocks around the edge. So that's likely to sort of be more red blocks. This one, oh, the yellows look a little precarious there. If you bumped into that, they would likely fall and all end up on the floor. That's probably going to be more yellows. The one in the middle, they have those same blocks, but hey, they're probably going to end up on the table there, so probably more red. Whereas this one, wow, there's a big tall stack of yellow blocks. I bet they'd end up on the floor, maybe yellow. And so think about the process by which you do that. Unless you've read this paper, you've never seen this task before. Uh, and yet you're able to, in your mind, create a kind of simulation, a physical simulation in which you very quickly develop what the 3D structure of these uh, problems is. You imagine what that would be like in real life. And you picture if you bump into it, how would those blocks move? What's their physical dynamics? How are they gonna interact? Clearly you can't get it exactly right, but you do a statistical model that's good enough that you're fairly confident of what a uh, likely behavior would be. And so this is an example where our own minds can very rapidly synthesize a new model, a new simulation, including statistical elements that will address a, a task that is uh, posed to us in English, in words, and images that are shown to us visually. And so quite remarkable, and yet we do it very transparently and easily. And so we would certainly like AIs to be able to do this kind of task in the same way. And so it turns out that human cognition uh, is based on a core of knowledge and the psychologists have really identified four separate strands of that. 
uh, and they apply, uh, infants are born with it. Uh, the, the infant knowledge of these four, four domains uh, improves radically. And so human adults are really good at these things, uh, but infants have them when they're born and they use them as the foundation on which they build up their knowledge of the world. Uh, they apply to all different cultures. They've been studied in lots of different cultures. Uh, primates, the apes, um, cognitive core of knowledge in the human uh, 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 psyche is uh, knowledge of physical objects and their mechanical interactions. The idea that the world breaks up into entities, that these entities tend not just to disappear uh, out of nowhere, they have continuity and that they move through space, they tend to move in a smooth way, they tend to interact with one another only when they are in contact. Those are the kinds of rules that we're, we're uh, born with. And then as we interact with the world and learn about it, we refine those into more detailed things. And eventually we get full-blown full physics as opposed to intuitive physics. The second domain is the domain of uh, animate, object, uh, animate agents and their goal-directed actions. And that's the idea that other humans and other animals have goals and that they do things for a purpose. And uh, you begin to understand uh, how that works. Uh, understanding that other agents have a different model of the world than we do, that they can see certain things and you can reason about that. And animals, newborn animals are able to see when a predator is looking at them and to be, know whether they should be afraid or not. Uh, the third domain is the domain of sets and numbers doing certain kinds of numeracy. Uh, and the last and the fourth domain is geometric relationships of uh, what the, where things are relative to one another. And so this is a sort of core knowledge that humans have that we use in our own cognition. And we would certainly like our AI systems to have it as well. Um, the, there's a bunch of work on generative models and to sort of uh, contrast the DQN Atari playing uh, uh, system, uh, Google just a few days ago released uh, a new version called uh, Google Dreamer version two, which instead of just directly predicting what actions in an Atari game that the agent should take based on the pixels on the screen, it builds a model, it builds a generative model of the effects of actions on the game, on each Atari game, and uh, then uses that model in a sort of dreamlike state to do planning to figure out what the best action is. And uh, this system is able to beat all the Atari games uh, it's able to beat the discriminative models uh, of those games or the model free reinforcement learning, if you're familiar with that, uh, on the same hardware. And so it's a very exciting development. And I think it's a, uh, an example of generative models moving to the next stage. Um, the area where you can really uh, represent things and the psychologists are doing amazing things here is something called probabilistic programming. These are ordinary programs that have stochastic elements in them, probabilistic uh, actions. So you can you know, take a branch left or right according to a coin flip. And the, the new twist in probabilistic programming is that you can do inference in these systems. And so an example is a system called Pyro that is built on top of PyTorch that uh, Uber developed. And now it has become uh, open source and it's with the Linux Foundation. And uh, it enables the next sort of the next generation of inference you can incorporate deep learning neural nets in there, but you can do much more sophisticated things. And most recently, a very nice system called DreamCoder was developed, which is actually able to synthesize probabilistic programs for particular tasks and then uh, use them to solve those tasks, very much like the situation with, uh, that we just did with the, the blocks on a piece of, on a table. And one of the most exciting things to me about using probabilistic programs for doing AI uh, issues is that you can use them to reason about reasoning. And so you can write a probabilistic program that models another probabilistic program and predicts what that second probabilistic program will do. Well, that's a, an AI version of what the psychologists call theory of mind, which is figuring out what another person is thinking and uh, predicting if you take certain actions, how that other person will respond to that. That is absolutely central to many of the important applications of AI. Think about an AI teacher who is modeling one of their students. What does the student know? What, what piece of instruction would best help the student uh, learn, learn a certain domain? AI counselors, say psychological counselors, model what's going on with that person. What is the dysfunction that they're struggling with? Uh, AI co-creation, 
one of the, I think the most important tool, AI tools will be tools that help empower humans to do things that they, we were not able to do before. And in particular, imagine the unbelievable capacity for artists if they have a tool like the, like the DALI uh, where you can empower your own uh, creative visual imagination using an AI tool. Well, if the AI can model what's of interest to you, what you know about what you're good at, that can make that tool uh, all the more uh, powerful. And so I think this kind of AI empathy is going to be central to many things moving forward. And finally, these uh, new generation of generative AI models are going to drive rapid innovation uh, because they will have good models of business processes, social processes, physical processes. They'll be able to combine them and mix them together in new ways to solve problems in a, in a very innovative way that will drive the pace of investment in business much, much more rapid than we have today. And similarly, in the social and entertainment domains, we can expect to see extremely, you know, imagine if you could generate a movie, a full-blown, highly rendered, fully emotional movie based on an idea that you have uh, in a matter of a few hours. Um, wh what will happen to our entertainment landscape in that environment? And so I think we should expect to see uh, an increase in the rate of pace of uh, innovation and development. And to manage that and to respond to that innovation, we're gonna need AI systems that can deal with a changing environment. And for that, we can't be old discriminative models trained on large amounts of uh, labeled, hand-labeled data uh, for a fixed environment. That's not gonna cut it. And so we're gonna need these kind, this kind of generative model in order to respond to that rapidly changing social environment. Uh, generative models are going to be able to empathize and co-create with humans, and I think that potentially could lead to uh, a very rich and very uh, uh, stimulating uh, environment for people to live in. And so I am foreseeing a glorious human future that will be much bigger than those Price uh, Cooper Waterhouse projections uh, because of all the possibilities that we get from this kind of system. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, uh, and uh, suggestions from anyone. Okay, so we've got two great questions so far, and I think people have been very um, absorbed into the PowerPoint presentation. So you guys, this is your opportunity now to ask a question. Please use the Q&A button. So we've got, the first question is from Frank. Frank is asking, why is this different? And I believe this must have been at a specific moment. Uh, why is this different than HAL 9000 and how will we ever learn to trust it? Yeah, well, certainly that gets into a whole other bag of <laughs> worms, which is the, uh, the safety issues, which are, are big and important. And uh, fortunately, there are now quite a few groups who are focused full time thinking about how do we ensure that these systems, first of all, behave in the ways we expect them to behave, and also that what they do is positive for humanity? And so, you know, there's a big social dialogue right now about, um, you know, what is the impact of big technologies? And fortunately, I think there's a lot of really good thinking going on. I also think that these AI systems, particularly those which understand human psychology, what are our values, what really matters to us, we can use those systems to simulate some new advance. Somebody says, wow, I'm gonna introduce this new social system. Won't this be great? We can check it out. We can see you know, what's the likely impact of this. Is this gonna make people addicted? Is this gonna make people um, you know, not uh, you know, give, give up things that they care about? And so uh, I, th I think the opportunities are gonna be there. Clearly, we're gonna have to manage this very carefully and with a lot of uh, insight and intuition. Absolutely. Um, okay, perfect. And now we have another question from, this is from Steve, another Steve. Uh, he's asking, and I don't believe Steve is still on here. I know he was having some audio issues, so, uh, but he appreciates getting this answer because he'll watch the recording. He asks, is there a parallel between computer AI systems and biological neural systems? Does the discriminative and generative differences have anything to do with the layers of neural systems stacked on top of each other and watching? Uh, sorry, um, watching what underlying systems are doing and responding slash modifying the underlying systems. And then he says that he'll catch up later. So if you want to take a crack at that, Steve, appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah, I, that's a fantastic question. And I think uh, uh, I actually think there's a whole new philosophy of biology that's going to emerge from this, because 
if you just um, you know, use uh, simple evolution, statistical evolutionary processes, discriminative networks are the first thing you get. And so uh, in biology, we often call those stimulus response organisms. And if you look at how you know, one cell creatures, uh, paramecia or bacteria, how do they deal with their environment? Typically, they sense something and then they respond directly based on what they sense. They probably don't have a detailed model of quantum physics and chemistry and so on. And so that's an example of a discriminative model. And in a very simple environment that's very predictable and repeatable, great, that's a perfect solution. As they start to get more sophisticated, multicellular organisms, now that simple sort of stimulus response is not good enough. Uh, and so beginning to build a more complex model of the environment, which lets you a reason internally about what actions to take uh, gives you a huge amount of leverage. And so I think as we look at more and more advanced animals, we see the development of the ability to basically simulate what their actions are likely to lead to. And um, in the human brain, for example, uh, it's known that there are you know, neurons that go directly from the visual cortex uh, forward through a number of areas to the motor cortex, but there are 10 times as many fibers going backwards as there are forwards. And so there's a very complex loop and there's a lot of evidence that humans do are, are capable of doing uh, visual simulations of tasks and of situations. And so uh, it looks to me like we've got both kind of that sort of direct discriminative uh, system and this sort of generative system and that we train the discriminative systems from these generative systems. And they're starting, there's a, the idea of Kristen who's done some really interesting things on energy based, based models of uh, neuroscience and there's the Bayesian brain, and many of them include uh, both of these kinds of models. And so I think that's gonna be an area that really is gonna open up understanding of neuroscience. Very fascinating. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and thank you, Steve, for your question. So now we've got a lot of more questions coming in. I'm gonna start at the top here and um, because I'm looking on who's, uh, what questions are getting upvoted, guys. So if you see a question that you like, upvote it, and then I will pick on that one first. So this is from Dan. Dan asks, why do you think generative AI is not used as an everyday tool yet? What are the obstacles? Yeah, so the generative AI in some ways is much more powerful. It's able to learn from a small number of examples and to generalize, but it's tricky um, you know, to, to really use it well. You have to know your domain and understand it and have appropriate priors. And you've got to do inference on these models. So you've got a great forward model. You've got to figure out how to go backwards. And so uh, there's a lot more subtlety. It's much harder to do. The, the current uh, uh, generation of generative models like GANs are notoriously difficult to train. So it's not as easy as out of the box the way the current discriminative models are. And so I think that's why they haven't really made it uh, yet uh, to have a very big impact on, say, business processes. Uh, but I think that's going to change. And I think as our systems become more sophisticated, that they will become much more out of the box and that ultimately they'll be much easier to apply to important domains because they can actually uh, learn sophisticated models of those domains. But we're not quite there yet, I would say. And so it's still very much at the research frontier. Okay, we've got a little bit of time left to wait then. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you, Dan. Uh, Suresh asks, Great and succinct, uh, but informative session on the future of AI. Thanks, Rush. Question, the book uh, Zen and Art of Motorcycle Maintenance alludes to the scientific slash deductive method, still needing intuition slash inspiration, the classic art versus science juxtaposition. How does the inspiration slash intuitive side come into the future of AI? Is there a natural limit or boundary that we may not be able to cross? Mm, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Of course, we don't. Uh, there's a, there are a lot of things we don't know about human intuition and about human consciousness and human awareness, uh, and so we're still at the point where it's sort of speculative to think about our AI is going to be able to do everything that we do. But we can begin to see some of the elements of we can see current AIs are able to, uh, with the appropriate structure, generate new and creative uh, um, solutions to problems. Uh, it's both sort of a charming and also a little bit scary to see some of the AIs that play, say, video games have found holes in the design of the video game, whereby, you know, doing something you're not at all supposed to do, crashing uh, your car into the wall and having it light on fire that, you know, causes fire trucks to come that gets you somehow gets you extra points. 
they discover that kind of stuff. And so uh, in, some, in that way, the systems have a sort of uh, intuition or creativity that is maybe a little different than human uh, creativity. I think, I think that if I'm reading between the lines of the question, it, there's really also a human sense, almost a human compassion or a caring that we would love for our AI systems to share. And I think that's one of the great challenges at, that, at this point is how do we ensure that the systems we build are really um, aligned with human values and human caring. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited by the possibility of AI empathy, of AI systems which can model what's going on with a human. In, uh, there's something called inverse reinforcement learning, which is by looking at what's, what an agent does, you figure out what are they trying to accomplish? What are their goals? And from that, you can then help uh, contribute to those goals. And so uh, one of the thoughts in the sort of uh, uh, beneficial AI community is that we can use the behavior of humans, work backwards, have AI systems which work backwards, which are empathetic with us, and figure out what do we really care about and help us do more of that. And so uh, if we do it right, these AI systems whether or not they are intuitive in the sense that humans are intuitive, they can help us evoke our highest good and our highest level of intuition. So that would be my hope. I love that. Ooh, exciting. Great question, Suresh. Um, this one is getting a lot of upvotes right now. James coming in with this question here. With so many capabilities possible with generative models, including software creation at superhuman speeds, when will machines develop AI better and faster than humans? Yeah, that's a great question. That's, There's no AI talk without the super intelligence question. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, this is the mechanism for super intelligence. And so, so in normal um, neural net world, uh, there's something that's called um, um, auto ML, which is using AI search algorithms to find the structure of a neural net to solve a problem. And I would say Google is probably the leading edge of that. They published a bunch of papers and in general, they're now finding, if you look at like the leaderboards of which uh, neural network is the best at solving different tasks, uh, many of the best networks now are auto-generated, are these auto-ML uh, algorithms. And so it's very exciting, very important. They're also using um, auto-ML-like ideas to design chips. So Google has these TPUs, these tensor processing units, which are optimized for uh, simulating neural networks. And uh, they've built them themselves and they've used AI algorithms for laying out those chips and designing them. And they're finding much better uh, performance and efficiency than by the traditional tools. And so I think we see the beginning of AI systems being used to improve uh, AI systems. And I think that trend is definitely gonna, gonna continue. And it's a, it's a very important one. The dream coder uh, thing I, uh, project that I mentioned uh, is a, a sort of next next generation version of that where systems can actually generate code and um, potentially any computable probability solution is, is generatable. And um, that starts to get into the control issues of, uh, you know, when a system can generate anything, we better make sure we know what we're doing so that uh, it, it uh, has the values that we care about. And so that intersects with the previous question about um, as these systems become more powerful, how do we ensure that they're really aligned with human values? And uh, I think that's the most exciting question uh, at the moment in the world. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Great question, James. Um, okay, we've got another question here from Ed. Discriminatory models are initiated with lots of training data. What is needed to initiate a generative model? Well, the current generation of generative models, they also like a lot of data. And so, uh, for example, the language model GPT-3 from OpenAI, uh, that's trained on a huge amount of text from the web. One of the big advantages of the generative models is that it's generally unsupervised training. So you don't need to label all that data. And so, um, you know, the world has a lot of data. The internet has become an amazing data source, sharing data all across the world but it's not very neatly organized and it's not very neatly labeled. And so uh, techniques, many of the discriminative techniques need very precise labels and a whole industry uh, arose of companies that specialize in human labeled uh, you know, examples. Uh, I think that's sort of going down a bit now. Uh, and one of the reasons is that these generative models can work with unlabeled uh, data. And so, 
Uh, as we get to the more sophisticated next generation of uh, generative model, uh, then you don't need so many examples. You know, human, uh, human children learn eight to 10 words a day. Unbelievable. I mean, this is a mind boggling fact uh, that, uh, you know, the complexity of human language and they're, they're, you know, at that rate, that pace of they're like sponges uh, sucking in all what's going on around them. And very few of those are the parents saying, okay, this is a horse. We say horse, you know, uh, it's more, they just see things in context and they generalize and they use their built-in prior, if you like, of the core knowledge uh, as a very strong constraint on how uh, words are like what words are likely to mean, together with uh, reasoning about you know how people are using it, what people care about, and they um, humans are able to build up this knowledge from very very sparse amounts of data. And so I think our AIs will eventually do that as well. Yeah, they do. Wow, incredible! Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, Ed, for your great question. Now we have a question from our good friend Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl asks, researchers have been working on biases in discriminative systems. How do we get around the deep biases in generative systems? Good question. Yeah, great question. Um, I would say the current generation of generative systems like GPT-3, um, they just learn what you give them, right? And so GPT-3 is trained on tons of text on the web. And so it's got a lot of very wonderful, positive, great stuff. And it's got a lot of you know, dark and, and negative things in there too. And that if you give it the wrong prompt, it, it, that negative stuff will come out. And so I think it's one of the challenges that OpenAI is struggling with. Uh, I think they're partnering with Microsoft in, in actually trying to commercialize uh, GPT-3. I think one of the challenges is how do you keep the negative stuff that's in the training set, how do you keep that out? Well, I think the ultimate solution is you need AIs which really know um, what matters to people. They've got to have the semantic and the human context. And so if you have empathetic AI with good models for what people care about, what is a uh, racist or sexist or negative or hateful piece of speech, you know, in order to cut that out, you don't just want a discriminative model that says, oh, this is hateful, this is hateful, this is hateful. You want a system which actually understands why it's hateful and that uh, just like a really good human author would be, you know, subtle and sensitive in how it expresses things so that it doesn't uh, tap into that. So I think that sort of calls for the next generation of AI, which includes a lot more uh, human, uh, human modeling. That makes complete sense. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you, Cheryl, for your great question. We've got a question from Sanjeev now. Uh, he's asking, will generative models enable transfer of learning across different types of cognition? Recognizing speech slash video versus understanding the likelihood of blocks falling over. And then there's a follow-up to say, will explaining, uh, will explainability of these models require people to be trained on the theory of these models? Mm, both really good questions. Yeah, the transfer thing is super, super interesting. Um, a bunch of early experiments are, are coming up whereby um, knowledge is somehow being transferred in generative models, the, generally the, gener the early, the first stage of generative model. Um, for example, you can, um, uh, uh, the, one of the areas of really exciting uh, use right now is in theorem proving, trying to uh, prove mathematical theorems and solve mathematical problems. And what uh, some groups have discovered is that if you train those models on text from you know, scientific news groups on the web, that kind of thing, but still on language, that, that language structure that's learned, that lang generative language structure helps improve the capability for mathematical theorem proving. And so that looks like an example, I would say it's still early days, it looks like an example where the structure and the knowledge and the mathematical relationships it's implicit in language, uh, can be extracted and learned by these systems and applied in another domain. And so uh, certainly, you know, transfer between visual domains and natural language domains, I think lots and lots of opportunity there. Um, I think uh, understanding human dynamics um, and how does that transfer to, to other situations, that's gonna be big. So yeah, I, I think that's a really, really exciting and interesting area 
uh, that that it's we're just just tapping the beginning of that at this point. And what was the second question? The second question, and apologies, I got some yard work going on outside. <laughs> um, so he asked, "Will explainability of these models require people to be trained on the theory of these models?" Oh, that's a good, really good question too. Um, yeah, early on with neural nets, you had to be an expert. Basically, you had to write your own code. You had to figure out how to take derivatives yourself. Then tools have come along that make it much, much easier. So PyTorch and TensorFlow, hey, they'll do the derivatives for you. And now you can go to GitHub and get the, the structure of a network. You still kind of have to know which network you should apply to which problem. But that's actually you know, not very, doesn't require anything very sophisticated. Um, the current generation of, of sophisticated models, I think, are still at the level where you've got to understand statistics better and a lot of those kinds of things. One of the interesting things about GPT-3 is that you can get it to solve language problems that it was never trained on by uh, giving it a prompt which shows examples of that. So uh, GPT-3 is just trained mostly on English text on the web, but even in English text, there's a little bit of French that's in there. And it is just to kind of as a side note, it has figured out some French. And so you can say, give it some examples, you know, say fromage means cheese. What does this mean? And it will use the example that you give it and will generalize from that and can go, can find the answer. So it can actually do pretty good translation, even though it was never trained to translate. It was never, you know, given a, a lot of text to translate. And so uh, some people are saying there's a, a kind of designing the prompt is all you need in order to program GPT-3 in that type of model. And so once the systems get smart enough where they can really empathize with what you care about, then it should just be you describe it in the language that you like, that is familiar to you, and it knows enough about you that it can figure out what you mean. And so I hate to say it, but I think a lot of traditional programming is going to become obsolete because uh, these systems will be able to figure out from you what problem you're trying to solve and will know by far much better, you know, algorithm, the best algorithms anywhere in the world for solving it. And so, so I think that that kind of expertise is going to fade away. But what will still be important is your judgment as to what you want, what questions are worth asking, uh, what is a good solution, selecting between things. Th that, I think that's where the human uh, input is going to shift more to that level of, of thing. That makes complete sense. Um, Sanjeev, great questions. Thank you so much. Our next question, and we have a little more time. We've got about 10 minutes, a little under 10 minutes left, and we've got four questions left. So Prasad asks, the current estimates for the economic value for AI is mostly around supervised learning, parentheses, 85%, and a very small percentage is on generative AI. Do you think these estimates fail to consider the new use cases for generative AI? What is your opinion on the economic value that can be added from the use cases for generative AI? Great question. Yeah, that's this is actually a thing I think about a lot. If you look at, you know, you're trying to predict what's going to happen in 10 years. The most obvious thing is you take existing business processes and you figure out how to do them more efficiently. So, for example, one of the big use cases is predictive maintenance of uh, factory equipment. So today, you know, you have a lathe or something, and if uh, if it, you know, you you don't repair it and oil it in the right way, well, it breaks. It's expensive. The the whole assembly line goes down. It's you know, big big pain. So it's a great use case for a pretty simple discriminative AI. It, you know, you put sensors on your machines. You sense when it's getting near and a time when it needs maintenance, and then you talk about the maintenance. That's something like a five hundred billion dollar a year industry or something like that. So. So that's an example where huge economic value, but it's really just doing what we already do more efficiently. Where the huge, huge, really big value is in inventing something totally new. So I'm thinking of the transition from like the Nokia phone, cell phone to the iPhone. The iPhone opened up all this new stuff that we didn't even know we needed. And it was only when Apple sort of, you know, uh, had the creative vision to create this new device I remember amazing quotes from the earlier era where like Nokia was totally, you know, they didn't think this newfangled thing was going to interfere with their phone business at all. And so it's very hard to see in advance, you know, what the new uh, value creation is going to be. And um, in some sense, you know, the whole field of marketing is all about creating value out of nothing. There's a wonderful book called Alchemy uh, by uh, Rory Sutherland that analyzes 
you know, products like um, Red Bull, which is in a little teeny can, it's very expensive, it tastes horrible. Uh, if you ask, you know, Coca-Cola, you know, is this product gonna be a winner? They say no, but because Red Bull fit a new niche, it was a new kind of a product, it opened up a huge uh, new market segment. And so I think we're gonna see that on all kinds of fronts that uh, these AI systems are gonna uh, solve problems we didn't know we had, and they're gonna open up opportunities that we were unfamiliar with. And so one of the challenges of that, it's very hard to predict what that's gonna be like. It's sort of like, it's gonna be an, I think it's gonna be a new age of innovation and the value that comes from that. I mean, who would have guessed that these non-fungible tokens, these NFTs, would sell a little piece of digital artwork for $69 million, right? I mean, that's an example of a recent thing, which is you know, totally out of left field. And I think we're gonna start seeing that type of thing happening all the time. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, great question, Prasad. So then John has a question and John is asking, oh, and he wants to let you know, thanks for your informative talk, Steve. How long do you think it would take to mature the technology and make it business as usual? Do you think it will become a democratized tool or something that requires a very specific skill set or deep knowledge that companies will need to invest in? Yeah, that's a really good question. I've been fascinated by the unfolding of the, the deep learning technology. I would have thought that, you know, a really good deep learning translation system or a speech recognition system would be viewed as the competitive advantage of a company and they would hold that really tight to the vest and that this would be the you know, big struggles on that. Not at all what has happened. What's happened instead is all the big companies have fallen over all over one another to give away their very best stuff to publish as much as they can. You know, there were something like 18,000 papers about GANs published last year. I mean, just unbelievable explosion of sharing of knowledge and of tools and of working code. And so I don't know if that's gonna continue. I mean, we're, you know, as these systems get into the competitive dynamics of business more, uh, I'm guessing that things are gonna shift a little bit and people are going to be treating their systems and the, particularly the, the creative knowledge bases that underlie them more as part of the, their value add. But I don't really know. It, that, that's one of the things I'm actually really fascinated about is what is the likely social unfolding of the, the spread of this technology? So far, it looks like it's all gonna be given away uh, freely and there'll be you know a hundred training courses on YouTube on how to use this stuff best and so so very demo I think democracy is winning so far <laughs> I like that that's good thank you John for your question we've got just two more questions left and I think we can squeeze it out so uh Harsha asks Steve can you say a few words about the role and importance of synthetic data generation especially in healthcare mm. yeah that's a really interesting uh, domain in some ways, that's a way to use your generative model to improve your discriminative model, right? You can generate synthetic data and it has a lot of benefits like the synthetic data doesn't uh, have privacy problems and you can control it. So it doesn't have sort of hidden, uh, you know, gotchas in the middle of it. And so, yeah, I think synthetic data is a really nice, nice way to interface between systems in some sense. Perfect, thank you. And then our last question is again from Suresh. Uh, Suresh is asking a question from the perspective of a student of cognitive science slash computer science. Uh, then they specify there seems to be uh, multidisciplinary approaches within cog sci programs. So A, human dev slash linguistics slash philosophy, B, neuroscience slash biological, and C, computer science. What advice would you give an aspiring student academically and practically on which sub-branch seems to offer the most promise for breakthroughs in AI? Mm, very interesting question. I think there's going to be a lot more synergy between, uh, as, he, as he pointed out, the psychological side, the biological side, and the technological side. And uh, groups are just doing amazing things. I've been really stunned by uh, Josh Tenenbaum's group at MIT that's really integrating some of the leading edge of AI systems with leading edge of psychological thinking. And uh, so lots of work happening now on neuroscience too and bringing that in. So the synergy of those, man, what a great, if you're just starting out, what a great uh, place to position yourself to learn about both fields and bring them together. I think it's a great time for that. 
I totally agree. Great questions. Such great question, uh, all of you guys. These were really some fascinating questions. And thank you so much to Steve, our incredible speaker. I hope you guys learned as much as I did from this whole session. Um, this session is going to be emailed out to you guys tomorrow, and the video recording uh, link will be in that email. And without any further ado, any closing thoughts from Steve or Ravi? Thank you, Steve, for this kind of uh, broad, in-depth, energetic uh, uh, presentation and, and great questions, by the way. Yeah. And of course, your responses to the question. And thank you, Maddie, for for moderating uh, the <laughs> questions and, and, of course, for putting this together. We look forward to seeing everyone uh, really soon. And we do typically two to three events a month. So looking forward to seeing you soon. And thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for joining and we'll see you hopefully next week. Remember to sign up for our event. All right. Take care, guys. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.